This is it. He put it this way. Listen, in this book, Where is God When It Hurts? And this is a great book for anybody that's been hurting, Philip Yancey. Now listen, rejoicing in suffering does not mean Christians should act happy about tragedy and pain when they feel like crying. It's okay to cry. Such a view distorts honesty, a true expression of feelings. Christianity is not phony. The Bible's spotlight is on the end result. The use God can make of suffering in our lives before He can produce that result, however, He first needs our commitment of trust in Him, and the process of giving Him that commitment can be described as rejoicing. It is attitude that determines the outcome. Attitude. I think of a uh, real-life situation. Life, uh, in fact, it is a movie that my daughter wanted me to watch about a man named Sam Childress. I believe that's the way he says his last name, and he is working with the uh, orphan children in Sudan. In Sudan, they try to take these children, they, what they do is they take these kids, and a man by the name of Kony, you've probably heard of him, he takes and he go, and, and attacks these villages. He takes all the children, kills all the adults, even forces the kids to kill their own parents. And right now he has kidnapped 40,000 kids and put them at this moment, speaking pretty recently, 40-some thousand kids, put them into harm's way. Little kids put guns on them, force them to be soldiers, the boys, take the girls and force them into sex trades. It's awful. And that's what he's doing over there, but he's doing it all in the name of Christianity, which is pretty bad, isn't it? Because he's, he's trying to build this Christian army, so to speak, against the Muslims in the north. So that's what he's doing. Well, this missionary, not missionary, excuse me, let me go back and tell you about Sam. He was a derelict. I'm talking about a guy that had lived a rough life. In fact, he just, he served prison time for crimes and all that, and he got out of prison. Sam did, and when he got out, his old friend showed up, and he said, I don't want anything to do with that life, but he didn't know where to go. His wife begged him to go to church with him. He went to a little church, not much bigger than ours. Walked in and sat down, heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and gave his life to Christ. Boy, when he got it, he really got it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, boy, he was, he, he, he got baptized, turned his life over to Jesus. Sam then uh, began to ask God, what do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do? And so what happened is, is he went on a humanitarian trip over to, to actually Uganda. Because Kony's also in Uganda doing you know, his work there, both places. But he went over just trying to help build some things and help them with the uh, necessities of life. Uh, building wells, building buildings, trying to you know, provide water. And, and he heard about all these things that went on. And so one day when all of them were taking a vacation one day and going and you know, rafting down the rivers and going to the city to, you know, to take a break and all that, he hitched a ride on an old bus and he wanted to see these war-torn areas. And they warned him. They said, it's not safe for you to go there, but he went. And when he showed up, he saw just recently the soldiers, the rebels had come through, Pony's rebels, and had recently just burned a village down, kidnapped children. He saw children blown in half. He held some of them in his arms as they were dying. And he went back to America with a, he couldn't get it off his mind. He gets home and his wife says, how was the trip? He says, fine, but he couldn't get it off his mind. He couldn't sleep. One night, he stayed up all night long. All night long. His wife said, coming through the next morning, said, what are you doing? He was drawing all this stuff. He was a contractor by tree. That's what his business was. And he knew how to draw plans and things like that. And he drew up these plans. And she said, what's that? He said, right across the street from the house. He said, there's an open field. He said, we're going to build a church over there. She said, how are we going to build a church? We don't even have a pastor. He said, I don't know, but God wants me to build a church. And he said, and it's going to be a different kind of church. He said, it's going to be the one where Darren, like myself, can come, where you don't have to be good to go. He said, no matter what you've done, you can come in. He said, that's the church. And man, he somehow got the land and, and worked it out. And he had some friends with him, some other guys, ex-cons, and they all built the church. And on the first Sunday, you had a touchy heart when you watch it. He walks in. And he invited a pastor to come and preach. That's what he was going to do is invite guys in until somebody felt led of God to take it. His wife walks in. How many of you are with me still? Amen? You with me? His wife walks in, and he's there in the back, and he's actually under. This is the first Sunday they've opened the little building. It's not a big building, you know, hold a, uh, you know, 150 people or so, but had a couple bathrooms in the back. And he's underneath the uh, sink, and he's, the plumbing had messed up. And here he is fixing the plumbing, you know, the pipe. He's got his, his work clothes on. And he's trying to fix the toilets and all that. And you know, all this is, you know, trying to get it right. And he, you can hear him in the background. There's a lady in there that had been invited. And she's, you know, they got a little band. And they're singing worship songs. And, 
And uh, she looks at him. She says, hey, called him. I said, he's not here. He said, give him a call. Tell him he's got to get here. She said, I've tried to call. He won't answer. And he said, well, who's going to preach? And she looked at him and said, I thank you, Sam, because God laid this on your heart. He got up from under the stage and walked in there. <laughs> Water still all over his clothes. Walked to the pulpit. And he gave the first sermon at a church. And he felt God leading him. This is a true story. God leading him to lead his people. That's what he did. He went back to Sudan. And he told him that first Sunday, this is what we're going to do. He said, we're going to have a church here for the glory of God, for people that are not good, that just need, need grace. By the way, every church ought to be that way. Amen? We all just need grace. That's it. And he said, I'm going to tell you what else you're going to do. He said, we're going to build an orphanage in Sudan. That's what he said. To rescue kids that are being destroyed by home. And that's what they did. And he went and he built an orphanage. Well, when he built this orphanage, he's back and forth in both places. His wife and another friend of his is leading the church back home. You know, and he's going back and forth. And that's their main vision and goal is to, to help these kids. And when he's over there, he's built this orphanage. And, and they, the rebels come in, they burn it to the ground. And literally, he's having to protect and, with his own life those kids, you know, because they're still trying to threaten him. And he's going through all these things. And when he goes through all these trials, this is why I bring this up this morning. Here is a man that is seems strong in his faith to do something like this. But when he goes through all these trials, it makes him have a bad attitude. One in particular was he went to rescue these children. He literally had to go, they had to build a little army. And, uh, and they had to go with guns. And because of his past, because ex con because he knew how to, he kind of worked with the mob, he knew how to work a gun, if you know what I'm saying, all right? And he's over in this country, over there, men marching through the jungles, killing these bad people with his army and rescuing these kids. I mean, he's like a, like a, a gun-shooting preacher, you know. So here we go. True story. And, and what happened is he only had a vehicle big enough to get half of these little kids that he found. They were all there being kidnapped. And he got half the kids and put them on his little vehicle. And he said, I'll be back. And when he got back, took them to a safe orphanage. He got back. He looked around and the kids were gone. And he looked over and there was a body this high of charcoal little bodies. They had burned those little kids to death. And he fell on his knees and he began to get angry at God. And he said, God, why? In America, they have all this money, all these things. And by the way, what really made it bad is he had gone to some rich businessman he knew about in the states before he went over there and begged him for $5,000 for a vehicle. One of them invited him to his house on Sunday and said, come over for a party. He went over there and as he walked in, the house, there's Mercedes and Lamborghinis and all these rich cars sitting in the driveway, big old mansion of a house. And he walks in and, and he's there with his family after the morning service because he thinks this guy's going to help him out over and he says, enjoy the party, Sam, and gives him an envelope. But when he hands him the envelope, the man he had asked for the money that he knew 5000 wouldn't put him out. He knew it. You know, to get this vehicle to rescue these kids, he goes in the bathroom and he opens it up and it's a check for $150. Now, $150, you might say, might be fine, but it made him mad. And he walked out and he looked at the man and said, you paid more for your dip of salsa than you gave me. And ripped the check up and left. I mean, it made him mad. The guy was like, hey, he had a temper on him, you know, but he was passionate. And left it. And then he's over here and he sees all these kids dying and he thinks about what could have been. So what happens to him is he goes back to the States. And he has, this is what I'm talking about, attitude. It doesn't matter who you are. Even Sam Childers, a man that had gone through all these things, got an attitude of hate and bitterness toward God. Went back. Began to treat his family very bad, his daughter and his wife, and got back into the life a little bit that he had known before because he was like, I, I, I can't do but so much, burn out with it, got depressed, and there for a while almost lost his family. And then, and then it was through these trials he went back over, and God used some of these kids to turn his, his life around and turn his heart around, and today he's still over there serving the Lord in this purpose. But I'm going to tell you, even this man had to realize that when trials come your way, God has not forsaken you. God was testing him to see what would happen. God was seeing the attitude. And today, he's still over. Number three, real quickly as we move on. Verse three and four, look what it says here. Knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Look at that. It helps you realize we can be certain God has a purpose. Amen. God has a purpose. The first purpose is this, that we may become perfect. Are mature. Now, we can't be perfect. I've never met a perfect person. 
In fact, if you think you're a perfect person, you just lie to yourself and you ruin it, all right? You're not perfect. No one is a perfect person. We've all sinned. We've all come short of God. But you know what? It's not talking about perfection here, like being perfect. You know what it's saying? That as we go through these trials, God uses them to make us more mature. More mature. That's what it means here. Not sinless, but mature and seasoned in our Christian experience. Have you ever noticed as you get older and as you've been saved longer and as you go through more things in your life, have you ever noticed they don't rattle you quite as much as they used to? How I many of you know what I'm saying? And you're a little easier going, you know, it's, when you go through it, it's not as, you know, don't get as rattled. And you say to people that are newer Christians, you say to them, it'll be all right. God's in control. It's all right. Now, if you have been saved for 35, 40 years and you still get rattled every time something comes your way, every trial, it shows a lack of maturity. I'm just telling you what James says. Because it doesn't matter about the number of years you've been saved. What matters is that you are maturing as you are saved. So, number two, you become mature. Number two, this is something else. You become entire, meaning whole and complete. Fully developed in your Christian experience. Entire. God can make you fully complete. And then number three, you are lacking in nothing. What that phrase means in this scripture is that God will provide everything that you need to remain obedient in your lives of faith. Listen to this statement. A Christian is not a Christian unless his faith is tested and proved. And yet we try to avoid being tested. Like I said, we all hate it. We don't like it. Not even in school. How many of you know that in school, when you talk about a test, it brings up a negative, uh, negative response? Right? Come on. You remember that? Adults remember. What about students? You like tests? Absolutely not. But it takes testing to know what we have learned in the subject. That's how we know. We, we know. And there's different ways to test. But in our own life, testing is, a, is the way God says, for a Christian, God uses it in our life to test and prove us. He's not just suggesting we consider trials a joy. I want to remind you, he is commanding us to look to God here in this situation. Count it all joy, look to God. It's not some kind of meaningless command, but rather a command for us to obey. Let me explain. If I said something to you, raise your hand into the air. Raise, I know, raise your hand there, please, if you don't mind. If you can, all right. I look around the room, everybody's got a hand. Everybody, thank you, put it down. Very good. Good job. All right. But I want to say this. Did you know that it's something you can do? However, if I said, jump up and touch the moon. Now, if you tell me after this service that you can jump up and touch the moon, then, then you're on something you ought to not be on. I'm sorry. It's just, anyway, there's a problem there. Because in your ulterior world, you may be touching the moon, but it's not possible, right? You see what I'm saying? This is the fact. The fact is, is that God doesn't tell us to jump up and touch the moon. God says, raise your hand. He does, tells you something you can do. It may not be something you want to do at the time. I could tell as I looked around the room. Some of you are like, oh, Pastor Tim. I just settled into my seat. I'm just getting comfortable, you know. You've just about put me to sleep this morning. You know, I don't know what it what is. But you understand Raise your head. We don't want to do it sometimes. Sometimes as people, you know what? Some of us are nature. We just don't like people telling us what to do. It doesn't matter what it is. Some of you, when I said, raise your head, some of you might have thought. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, it's between you and God, but some of you might have thought, why does he want me to raise my hand? Raise my hand when I want to. I don't know. But you were all obedient, and you did it. I don't know the hard attitude, but the fact is, is that God never asked you to do something you can't do. It's our attitude. That makes a difference. And along the way, understand this, it's not something that we cannot do. It is possible. It is possible to realize that God has a purpose in our life. But we have to make the effort on our own. No one else can do it for me. No one else can do it for you. It has to be a conscious decision that you make up in your mind. So what we've got to stop doing is going around whining about life. And all of us can do this, including me. And take responsibility for our own life. And go forward with God. Amen? That's what it is. Number four, let's move along quickly. Look at verse five through eight. It helps us to realize we're not intended to go through trials alone. Thank God for this. Because look what he said in verse five. This is how we're able to do it. Are you ready? Now, in verse five, he offers a solution to our feeling of inferiority. And here it is. If any of you lack wisdom, that's everybody here. That's me, right? I don't know why, Lord. I can't explain it. Let him ask of God. Amen? Which giveth to all men liberally. 
And then he, the, the phrase in the King James, which is what I use, says, and upbraideth not. Look what he said here. Upbraideth not. Now that term upbraideth, we don't use it today. I understand that, but it's very easy to understand. Okay? As a teacher, how many of you as a student in class ever felt like your teacher made you feel like an idiot for asking a question? Anyone ever gone through that before? You know what they're doing? They're upbraiding you. That's what they're doing. It's an old English term. They are making you feel foolish for asking a question. And then when that happens, you don't want to ask any more questions, right? Right? That's a natural human response. Well, God said, you can ask me anything you want. You can come to me about anything. I will give you wisdom, and I won't make you feel stupid for asking the question. Isn't that wonderful about God? Amen? Hey, that's why in our children's church this morning, right over here, and by the way, it's... It's up. There's a lot of kids in there this morning, at least for our us. Praise God. That's exciting. I walked back there, and they ran out of juice. And I said, Amen. And she looked at me and said, Well, we ran out of juice. I said, Let's go get some at the store. Let's go. You know, because you know what? We can solve that problem, but isn't it good to have the kids? Amen. All the kids. And you know what? They're, that's why when they take prayer requests, you know what I'm talking about if you ever worked with kids, and they raise their hand and they say, Pray for my cat. She's acting a little sad this week or somewhere. She won't drink her milk or whatever. You know, some of you think, does God really care about that? Thank God we can say to that child, God never makes you feel stupid for asking questions. Amen? We need to teach children that you can pray to God about anything. Amen? Anything. Anything. Because as you get older, no matter what comes in your life, it doesn't matter if the person sitting next to you thinks it's stupid or not. Who cares? God is the one that we should care about, and He cares about you. Amen? He cares about you. So what you're going through, God cares about. Because he says here in verse 5, come to me, ask me. I won't make you feel stupid for asking. I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Now, it's not philosophical insight about how to handle life, but it's spiritual wisdom provided through God's word and through prayer. So how can you do it? Come to him. Talk to him. Read his word. It's not given automatically. You must ask God. Sometimes people say, sometimes, I just don't know which direction to go. I just don't know. I just don't know. And I've said this myself. And the question is, why have you asked God? Because it says here in verse 5, if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God. No, I haven't thought about that. I thought God would just magically, poof. You know, there it is. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to talk to God. Prayer is important. Now, Look at this. So it helps to realize that. And wisdom is applied knowledge. It is knowledge put to use. That's what it is. You can count on Him. We're not intended to go through trials alone. Thank God for that. Here's my last thought this morning as we close. Number five, it helps us to realize God intends trials as a blessing. Now that's really different from our way of thinking. But look to verse 12, if you would please. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation or trials. For when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love Him. James ends this section on trials by saying in verse 12, Blessed. Now, how many of you have, know what the Beatitudes are? Do you know what the Beatitudes are? Where are they found? Go ahead and talk to me. Where are they found? Where? Matthew. Matthew. And it's the blessed. Blessed. Remember that? That's the Beatitude. Blessings on people. Now notice it's the same vein as that. As Matthew 5. He says, Blessed is a man that endures trials. Same thing. Or literally, after his trial is over, what will happen? He will receive the crown of life. Thank God your trial will be over one day. Praise God for that. So it is true that Christians don't have to endure the trial forever. Amen? But when it's over, the Bible says he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here's the declaration of the blessedness of one who passes the test. Blessed means happy. Better yet, it means satisfied. Better yet, it means fulfilled with inner joy. That's what it means. In fact, 5.11, James 5.11 says the same thing. Behold, we count them happy who endure. Now, this is not happiness due to freedom from trials. No. This is happiness due to victory over trial. Amen? There's a big difference. You see, we stayed out of World War II for as long as we could. You know our history on that? Some of you read it? For as long as we could. We tried to be... Uh, uh, you know, uh, our country wasn't behind it. Our president wanted to stay out of it. And then finally when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, we had to go. And when we went there, we lost a lot of men. In fact, you can go, they, the newest exhibit now, or the newest uh, uh, 
So anyway, it's a World War II monument. There we go, monument, the Kingdom of Might. And it's huge. They're still working on it. If you haven't seen it yet, it's pretty amazing. And it's the newest thing right there in the wall. And you know what? It's something to honor all the lives that were lost during that time. We lost a lot of lives. A lot of young boys with war. A lot of families lost boys to this war. People gave up a whole lot for it. But man, when they declared Victory in Europe Day, you know what I'm talking about. Victory in Europe Day, when they declared it, VE Day, man, I see pictures of people rejoicing, parades in the streets, soldiers coming home, balloons flying everywhere. Hey, yeah, we still have lost a life. Yes, we still, it was war, and it was terrible, the consequences on families and individuals, but at the same time, there was victory because we had stayed the course. You see what I'm saying? And in our life, to be honest with you, I don't think we have those kind of victories if we never have a trial. I don't believe we do. Because we don't understand how sweet victory can be until we go through the trial. Are you listening? But boy, when you go through the trial and God brings you out on the other side and you know that He's been with you and He's helped you through it, there's a sweet taste of victory. That's what it is. You're satisfied with the victory. And that's what God wants to give you. There are people who come and you see them and I see and they come to church and profess Christ and get baptized. Trouble comes into their life and they're gone. I mean, they're gone. They may never come back. But whatever struggle they had to go through, it was just overpowering and they walked away. They shook a fist at God and that was it. You see, perseverance through trials is the proof of a living faith. And you that are going through something, don't shake a fist at God and walk away. Stay faithful. God's here for you. Amen. He's here. He'll see you through it. And one day, you may not understand everything, but one day when we see Him, we'll understand it all by and by. It's true. And He'll explain. And the things that we go through make you stronger in Him. We all experience trials. But God has something great in mind. And James is calling us to see it. Here is how a Christian will look at the events of his life. Here's what God's plan is for you. I'm going to end with a a prayer here just a moment before we have invitation, but I want to know one last phrase by Charles Spurgeon. He was a great preacher of the 1800s. This is what he wrote. He said, I've always looked back to times of trials with a kind of longing, not to have them return, not to have them return, but to feel the strength of God as I felt it then, to feel the power of faith as I felt it then, to hang on to God's powerful arm as I hung on to it then. And see God at work as I saw Him then. What a great way to look at it. Amen.